Next on Current News, Archbishop Wilton Gregory is installed as the leader of the Catholic Church in the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. History is being made. He's the first African American to hold the post. We'll have team coverage. As the battle over abortion intensifies, I'll speak exclusively with the Archbishop of Mobile, Alabama about protecting life. I think it is most important. People have to have contacts with, uh, with different religions. That's Michael Barbara, who's Jewish, talking about his special connection with the Catholic Bishop of Brooklyn, Nicholas DiMarzio. It's a story you'll only see on Current News, and that starts right now. And with the love of God in my heart, I do accept the pastoral care of the people of God in the Archdiocese of Washington. Good evening, I'm Michelle Powers. A monumental day for the American Catholic Church. Archbishop Wilton Gregory has been installed as the leader of the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C., the first African American to ever hold the post. We have team coverage. Current News Tim Harfman and national correspondent for the Tablet and Crux, Christopher White, are standing by in the nation's capital. We begin with Tim, who is outside the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. Tim. Michelle, Archbishop Gregory is now the seventh Archbishop of Washington, D.C., one of the most powerful archdioceses in the country. His message to his new congregation, one of redemption and hope. Archbishop Wilton Gregory is now one of the most prominent leaders in the American Catholic Church, newly installed as the head of the Archdiocese of Washington, D.C. I come to this almost indescribably humbling moment in my life and in my ministry, filled with deep gratitude. He takes over the church in the nation's capital as the first African-American archbishop, an appointment historically held by cardinals. And if Gregory receives his red hat, he'd be the first African-American cardinal in the U.S. <laughs> Gregory accepts the new position at a time of turmoil. The archbishop succeeds Cardinal Donald Wuerl, who resigned after controversy surrounding his handling of abuse cases when he was Bishop of Pittsburgh. Archbishop Gregory is looking to rekindle the relationship between the church and the faithful. Our recent sorrow and shame do not define us. Rather, they serve to chasten and strengthen us to face tomorrow with spirits undeterred. With thousands witnessing history inside the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, the Pope's ambassador to the United States, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, made it official. With faith in our Lord Jesus Christ and with the love of God in my heart, I do accept the pastoral care of the people of God in the Archdiocese of Washington. I resolve to serve faithfully the spiritual needs of this local church. Gregory proudly processes around the Basilica with the official letter from the Holy Father. Bishops Gregory Mansour and James Massa say Archbishop Gregory is a great preacher and can inspire Catholics. I think Archbishop Gregory is, a, is good at helping people to heal. And I think he'll be good with, uh, with everybody in the Archdiocese, from the clergy all the way to the newly baptized. We're really fortunate to have him in the nation's capital uh, where uh, his pulpit um, has such a, a wide audience. Gregory now leads over 650,000 Catholics in the Washington, D.C. Archdiocese. Worshippers attending the installation are enthusiastic about their new shepherd. I just wish him peace and blessings and just encourage him um, to face all the challenges he'll have here in Washington and just across the country. We wish him well. We thank him very much for accepting this position and we look forward to working with him. And this installation was open to the public. There was such a demand for seating, the Archdiocese had to move the liturgy here instead of St. Matthew's Cathedral, which is described as the Mother Church of Washington, D.C. Michelle. Tim, quick question. What did you hear from the lay people in attendance who already knew Archbishop Gregory personally? 
I had the chance to speak to some Catholics who traveled up from the Archdiocese of Atlanta, uh, Archbishop Gregory's uh, latest appointment. They described him as a people person, caring and a great leader. They said he would be greatly missed, uh, but they wished him all the best, Michelle. All right, thank you, Tim. The Archbishop steps into his new role at a critical time for the Archdiocese of Washington. Fraught with scandal and divisions in the past, his appointment is all the more historic and consequential. Archbishop Gregory visiting Our Lady of Mercy High School in Atlanta, where he's been the head of the Archdiocese for the past 14 years. But the 71-year-old new Archbishop of Washington has deep-seated Midwestern roots, hailing originally from Chicago, where he graduated from the seminary and first ordained a priest in 1973. For this is my God. After earning his doctorate in sacred liturgy in Rome, he returned to Chicago where he was ordained an auxiliary bishop in 1983 and then appointed as the Bishop of Belleville, Illinois in 1994. Ten years later, Pope John Paul II naming him the sixth Archbishop of Atlanta. From um, Belleville going to Atlanta uh, was really just a, a wonderful shot in the arm for the African American community to have a young African-American Archbishop in Atlanta. Gregory also served as the president of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops at the height of the church sex abuse scandal. He was instrumental in helping pass the Dallas Charter, instituting a zero tolerance policy and guidelines for addressing allegations of abuse. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio was there. He was uh, very calm and stable and, and did lead us through it without ever losing his temper. He was able to keep people together, and that's a, that's a great uh, gift. Gregory's views align closely with those of the Pope on several major issues, like safeguarding the environment and protecting immigrants who are in the country illegally. Now with Pope Francis' historic appointment of the first African-American leader of Washington's archdiocese, Gregory could be in line to become the country's first African-American cardinal. He comes to Washington as a shepherd, not a politician. And um, I think that he will do just that. And then for the African-American community uh, to see uh, the first African-American Archbishop of, of Washington um, and, you know, maybe uh, the first African-American Cardinal of, of the Roman Catholic Church is a significant um, milestone uh, for the African-American community. Bishop DiMarzio, who considers Archbishop Gregory not just a colleague but a friend, is confident that he will steer his new congregation in the right direction. He's uh, someone you can confide in and get good advice and is concerned about other dioceses and how things go. So um, he truly is um, a good uh, choice. During his time in Atlanta, the diocese has grown to over one million Catholics under his leadership. Now as he heads to the Washington Archdiocese, where there's been a leadership void for about six months, Gregory will face a whole new set of challenges that he vows to tackle head on. We will reclaim the future for our families, for those who will follow us, that is my greatest, indeed, it is my only aspiration. As we mentioned, Archbishop Gregory's new post makes him one of the most powerful voices in the Catholic Church. The Archdiocese of Washington encompasses the nation's capital, the Catholic University of America, and the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception, the largest Catholic church in North America. Continuing our team coverage of Archbishop Gregory's installation, national correspondent for the tablet and Crocs, Christopher White, joins us now from outside the Basilica to look at the challenges the new leader is likely to face. Christopher, to what extent, if any, did Archbishop Gregory confront the abuse crisis during today's Mass? Well, Mel Michelle, we never heard the phrase sexual abuse, but it was woven throughout his 20-minute homily. He talked about the stormy seas that the church has faced over the past year, and then he made it personal. He said, look, when I make mistakes, I want to be able to come to you directly and for you to hear them from me, not for them to be revealed, which I think was his own acknowledgement to the past year and everything that the church has faced over, over the issue of sexual abuse. Now, while he is strictly the leader of only Washington, historically the Archbishop in D.C. has interacted with Congress and the White House frequently. Do we have any sense of what to expect from him on that front, Chris? 
Well, Michelle, the Archbishop has made it very clear from the moment he was first named in his opening press conference, he said, look, I, I come to Washington as a pastor, not a politician. He says, I wasn't elected to Congress. Uh, during a homily today, he spoke in broad themes, talking about the need to care for the poor and the forgotten, but he didn't delve into specific issues, which to me was a sign that he wants to focus on principles, not political issues. Now, as we've mentioned, because it is so monumental, he is the first African-American archbishop to lead the nation's capital, which is a longtime center of African-American culture in the U.S. Did this factor into today's mass in any way? Michelle, one of the more moving moments of the Mass came after communion uh, during a, a hymn from the Gospel Choir present here uh, in which there was a lot of clapping, hands in the air, shouts of amen, uh, which really ref reflected the Gospel roots uh, that he brings from Atlanta. And you could tell it was a bit of a homecoming uh, celebration for him. That sounds great. Now that he is officially installed, what do we expect Archbishop Gregory's first duties on the job will entail? Well, he sort of put his staff on notice. He said, don't expect me in the office. He said, look, I'm going to spend my first few months on the job going parish to parish, getting to know my priest and their people, because I can't understand the archdiocese without getting to know the people first. So I think that's what he sees as his number one priority. And Christopher, very quickly, last question. Among today's notable attendees were eight U.S. cardinals, 50 bishops, and 300 priests. Who else were among the guests today? Well, uh, we had a number of city council representatives, both from Washington and from his time in Atlanta. Uh, but there were there's a White House delegation as well, including Kellyanne Conway, who's a, an advisor to the president. So even if the archbishop doesn't want to engage in politics, this is a political town and there is no avoiding it here today. All right. Thank you, Christopher. There's a lot more news headed your way. I feel that I should address non-Jewish leaders with my concerns. Michael Barbara relying on his Jewish roots and letter writing to forge an interfaith connection with the Bishop of Brooklyn. The fight for life in America, why abortionists are protesting today. And as the pro-life movement grows, I'll speak with Alabama Archbishop Thomas Rohde about what his state is doing to protect babies. A federal judge is expected to strike down Mississippi's pro-life heartbeat law. Governor Phil Bryant signed the measure in March, preventing the killing of infants as early as six weeks into pregnancy. Today, U.S. District Judge Carlton Reeves is hearing arguments about the law. In 2018, he overturned a 15-week abortion ban. We are here to say enough is enough. Abortionists are opposing new laws that many states have been passing to protect the right to life. Hundreds of protesters took to the streets today in cities across the country. The biggest demonstration was held in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Pro-life advocates are hoping the recently enacted legislation will eventually lead the court to overturn Roe v. Wade. Despite protests, Georgia's Governor Brian Kemp is standing by his state's pro-life bill, saying he's keeping a promise made to Georgians. A lot of these folks are the same people that worked against me in the election. They said the same thing after I was sworn in, and now they're saying the same thing after I did what I promised Georgians I would do. The bill prevents abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. It is expected to face legal challenges. Alabama's Governor Kay Ivey is saying she isn't worried about any backlash after signing the nation's strongest protections for the unborn. Well, the bill passed House and Senate overwhelmingly, and the amendment to include uh, exceptions was defeated. So the legislature has spoken, and um, it underscores the sanctity of life that the people of Alabama value so highly. Facing threats of boycotts from outsiders, Ivy says she's confident the state's growing travel industry will remain strong. The Alabama law has sparked new intensity in the fight for life in America. The Catholic Church has been leading the battle to protect inf infants in the womb from a horrible death by abortion. Archbishop Thomas Rohde is the head of the Archdiocese of Mobile, Alabama, and he joins us now. Archbishop Rohde, thank you for being here. You support the Alabama law because, as you've said, life is worth protecting. Lawmakers have said their strategy is to get the law before the Supreme Court and with a new conservative majority of justices overturn Roe v. Wade. What do you think about that, Archbishop? Well, 
you know, I think the people of Alabama, not just Catholics, this has been a very broad-based effort. Even the, uh, the, the vote in the state Senate, 26 to 5, shows it's a broad-based effort. Catholics in Alabama, only 4%. And the effort is to try to call our country back to respect for life. So this uh, law is obviously going to be challenged in courts, and it's probably going to work its way up to the Supreme Court. Whatever happens to the Supreme Court, the struggle is going to go on beyond that, because even if uh, Roe versus Wade is re-examined, it, the, le- the legislatures in the state are where the effort's going to go next to try to pre- persuade uh, lawmakers to respect life. Now, like you said, Archbishop, Catholics only account for a small percentage of Alabama's population. The effort to enact the law was broad-based. Is the grassroots pro-life movement growing there? I think it is. It's certainly strong as was shown by this vote in the state legislature. We've spoken to some passionate pro-life advocates that worry the law goes too far because it eliminates the exemptions for rape, incest, and mother's health. And that could cause backlash. And we have President Trump, he's another supporter of life, who is for abortion exemptions. What does the church teach about any exemptions that would permit an abortion? And are you concerned about a possible backlash? Well, that's a political consideration of a backlash, and leave that for others. But every human life is precious, and that's the teaching of the church. Innocent life is to be protected, and we don't uh, we don't make something uh, we don't correct something that's wrong by doing another thing that's wrong. Uh, rape, incest are horrible things, but if a life develops from that. That's an innocent human life. And we're we're called to respect that life. Now from Alabama to New York, our governor here, Andrew Cuomo, forced an extreme abortion bill through the state legislature earlier this year. The harsh law eradicates virtually all restrictions on abortion, even up to the moment of birth. When you look at what Governor Cuomo has done, what is your reaction when he proclaims his Catholic faith? Well, he's certainly not showing Uh, any adherence to the Catholic teaching of the respect for innocent life. And I I think his uh, action in New York has energized people across the country who want to respect the the right of of life. And Archbishop Brody, my last question is, where is the future of this pro-life movement going? I think it's going to move forward, and I, I think the ultimate victory is always with the truth. Abortion is based upon uh, lies, it's based upon evil. I see among our young people more and more an awareness of what abortion is and their willingness to witness and stand up for the right for life. I think the pro-life movement is getting stronger and it's moving forward. With our young people. All right, Archbishop Brody, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. National correspondent for the tablet and Crocs, Christopher White, has written about the debate within the pro-life community over whether the new anti-abortion laws are the winning strategy for overturning Roe v. Wade. You can read his article right now at thetablet.org. There is a dangerous threat to the sacrament of confession developing in California, and the leader of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles is sounding an alarm. Archbishop Jose Gomez is opposing a bill that would force priests to break the confessional seal and report information about child sexual abuse. He's arguing that the legislation is a violation of religious freedom and wouldn't do anything to protect children. The retired Patriarch of Jerusalem, Archbishop Michel Saba, is pleading with the United States and Israel to move away from war. The cleric is urging them to bring peace to Israel and Palestine. Seeming to address President Trump, Saba said the American leader should pay attention to what is written in the Bible about peace. Still to come on Current News, Mr. Barbro and the Bishop and how they built a bridge of understanding between fates. Their moving story is next. The great lay leaders of the Brooklyn Diocese and how they're being recognized. It's a unique
unique friendship built on years of communication forged the old-fashioned way by handwritten letter from one man of faith to another. It all started when the Bishop of Brooklyn, Nicholas Jamarzio, opened up his mail one day. Kurtz News' Emily Druby has the story in this special assignment report. Hi Jeff, how are you? How are the Yankees doing? 85-year-old Michael Bobro is all about community and making connections. I like, I like your West sweater a lot. A longtime journalist, long retired, this Bronx native now spends his days chatting with residents in this modest assisted living facility in Canarsie, nourishing his mind and his faith with books, music, and the long-lost art of letter writing. I've been writing to His Excellency Bishop DiMarzio for, um, I would say, roughly two years. The bishop was always very kind to respond to my letters very kindly. Mr. Bobro's letters written longhand and sent to the bishop via snail mail are filled with historical references and talk of modern day controversies. He was initially inspired to reach out because of a letter he wrote to the editor of the tablet. In it, he agreed with the church's stance on abortion, even though he made it clear, I am not Christian, I am Jewish. After it was published, he decided it was time to make an interfaith connection. My Jewish faith, of course, uh, motivates much of my thinking. I, I mean, I believe in God, and I, uh, I feel that this is, um, you know, paramount in my life. I feel that I should address non-Jewish leaders with my concerns. Those concerns include the rights of the unborn and the importance of being a student of history, something Bishop DiMarzio greatly enjoys about their correspondence. They're fascinating letters because he is basically an historian. He knows the history of the Jewish people and he also knows his own personal history. He is very much up on current state of affairs, the political around the world. It's a letter you want to read because you're going to learn something. Like learning about Mr. Bobro's family, roots that go all the way back to Tsarist Russia. In Tsarist Russia, my family was pro-monarchy. My great-grandfather is an honor, person honored by Tsar Alexander III in the Royal Palace for his service to the state. I mean, you know, it's unbelievable. And Mr. Bobro is still going strong, using his words to make a difference and cherishing special moments, like when the bishop made a surprise visit. Well, I didn't know it was the bishop at first. He said, oh, hello, Father. May I ask who I'm speaking with? So His Excellency said, I'm Bishop DiMarzio. So I said, wow. <laughs> the visit giving both men a chance to continue to build a bridge of understanding. Well, I think it is most important. People have to have contacts with, uh, with different religions. This is important to us. We, our faith, uh, certainly since the Second Vatican Council, has taught us about the interreligious dialogue. He understands it. He lives it. Even Pope Francis agrees just a short time ago, reaffirming once again that we should not be afraid of our differences because that's just how God wants it. Ci sono tante religioni che alcuni nascono dalla cultura, ma sempre guardano il cielo, guardano Dio. Two different faiths intertwined and forever connected by a shared history of tradition and common values. He's uh, one of the persons I would say is a friend, a pen pal. <laughs> I, I I really feel, you know, he's not just uh, uh, he's not just the bishop, of course, but he I consider him as as a good friend. A tried and true form of art fashioned the old-fashioned way, but still bringing people together. Emily Druby, Currents News. The beginning of a beautiful friendship. Both men say they are looking forward to seeing each other again in person. But until then, Mr. Barbara will continue writing the bishop and making those interfaith connections. A record high number of men are studying to become priests in the Diocese of Phoenix. According to the Catholic Sun, there are 40 seminarians in the Arizona Diocese. That's the highest number in the diocese's history and double the number of men studying eight years ago. The Diocese of Brooklyn honored some great leaders last week. In a mass celebrated by Auxiliary Bishop Witold Marjewski, the Secretariat for Evangelization and Catechesis recognized the service of laymen and women as missionary disciples. They also elevated 40 faithful to be lay leaders within the diocese. Over 600 people attended the celebrations. That is Current News. I'm Michelle Powers. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.